Good morning. During this season of Advent, we speak of the coming of the Lord. And this morning, as we start our worship, we're going to sing a hymn that we normally sing in other times of the year. But I invite you to hear particularly its invitation for the coming of the Lord. And that's number 717, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. We are singing verses 1, 3, and 5. Number 717, please. services at Trinity United Methodist Church. Whether you're joining us on the radio or some other ways or electronically, we're glad you're here, but we are especially glad to see those that have made it into our sanctuary this morning. There are a few announcements that we have as we get ready for our Christmas season. We want to make sure you know that uh, our Christmas Eve services are at 6 p.m. Uh, so come, but don't expect to sit in your normal seat. There might be somebody else sitting in your seat and welcome them if they do. We're glad to have everyone here on Christmas Eve. Uh, Christy is trying to organize a nursery, so if you can help on Christmas Eve to keep the nursery, please let her know. Our Christmas Day services, and yes, we're going to, it's the Lord's Day, we will be worshiping on Christmas Day at 11 o'clock. It'll be a shorter service, it'll be a fun service, but we will be meeting on Christmas Day uh, at 11 a.m. You will see in the vestibule our church directory sign up there. Uh, don't forget our end of year giving that is coming. Uh, the end of year is coming, and if you need to make a gift, uh, please do so. Uh, by the, uh, our offices, be aware of, the, of when things are happening uh, with the church office as well. Uh, I'm looking for Josh Castleberry. Is he around somewhere? There he is. And now we have a word from our lay leader, always prepared, who's ready to run forward from the back. Well, I was, I was only half jesting, Josh. Good morning. Good morning. Have you ever had one of those Sundays where you have way too many things going on? No. No? This is, that's one of these Sundays for me. So I've got two things.
things to tell you. Um, the first is to sort of repeat what Dustin mentioned last Sunday, and that's that we are taking up a love offering for our staff, for um, the excellent work that they do all year. I think that it's a, a good way to show our appreciation for them. The second thing, potentially slightly more concerning, is I'm getting rid of Joseph for an entire month. We're just kicking him to the curb. <laughs> so, uh, the first time I flew in an airplane, they were talking about when the oxygen comes down, make sure that you put your mask on first before you help anybody else. And I turned to the guy beside me and I said, you know what? I want to help other people first. And it was an older guy. He was reading his Corvette magazine and he'd clearly been flying a lot longer than I had. And he said, well, you're not going to do a whole lot of good if you're knocked out, son. I'd put my mask on first before you help other people. So that's what I started thinking I'm, I'm going to do that. Sometimes you have to renew your own spiritual well-being before you can help others. So the Methodist Church allows for spiritual renewal. And um, Joseph has not taken that opportunity since he's been at Trinity. And um, SPRC has agreed that he should renew his own spirit, go forth and grow. And um, it sounds like he's having a fantastic time and there's going to be lots of opportunity for spiritual growth and renewal and happiness and I am looking forward for that for him. So if you have any questions about what that looks like or um, how that process works, talk to me, talk to Gray, talk to Dustin, talk to Joseph about what his spiritual renewal is going to look like. The month of January, the entire month of January and um, we are fortunate enough in this church that we have a uh, fantastic, what are you guys called? Old. We have fantastic old preachers who can step in and take care of the, uh, the pastoral work while Joseph is away renewing his spirit. And we've got uh, lay leadership that's going to step in as well. So we're really looking forward, not to Joseph being gone, but to the growth and the renewal that he's going to experience and the opportunity that we're going to have to, uh, to serve each other as a congregation. So again, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. And I think that's all I've got for right now. Thank you. Thank you, God. Now I pray that I invite you to stand and greet one another. In the name of the Lord. worship the Lord together. You may be seated.
bulletin. The congregation's response is in the darker print. Sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day. Seated. At this time, I'm going to call Rogers and Katie Grinnewalt to come forward as we light the candles of our Advent wreath. The wilderness 
that's in dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, who go astray. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah 35, 1, 2, 8. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much joy. The psalmist says, Happy are these whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, <clears throat> gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Psalm 146. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy, as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step, because we can see the destination, and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. This time, we, I invite you to turn to page 220, 2090 in your Advent, uh, for the Advent song, which is in the faith we sing, hymn number 2090, verse 3. with terrible recompense, 
He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless singing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall, come, shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The word of God for the people of God. This time we invite our children to come forward for our children's time. Take, have a seat right there. You're good to go. Hey, remember we were talking about our Christmas, which are our way of saying Christian monograms. And these are Christmas trees, and they are full of ornaments that symbolize things holy, things of God. Now, tell me, I'm going to use this one first. What is this? Triangle. Now, you will learn all, kind, all kinds of things in math class about triangles, but the angles are all equal. The length of each side is equal. Do you know what the triangle means in the church? What's the name of our church? Trinity. It means Trinity, that's right. But not the church. We're talking about God. Now, when we talk about the Trinity, not the ch what our church symbolizes, is the Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And what we look at on this is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are threes found all in our sanctuary. Now, this is called uh, a tri. Horta, if I think I got that name right. It also means Trinity of God. But look, it's like it's got three different shapes on it, but it's all in a triangle. See? And you can see the three different uh, things in there. That's a triquarta. And you will also see on our tree a fleur de lis. I think I'm pronouncing that right too, which means lily. Okay. It looks like an Easter lily, but look how many, how many, how many do we see here? One, two, three. All representing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now we have one more that just has three on it, and I wanted to highlight it for you. 
This is a seashell. What is, in, in the church, the seashell symbolizes baptism. Okay? And sometimes I baptize using a seashell. All right? But what I wanted you to see here are the three drops of water. Because you know when we baptize, when we baptize somebody, we baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have an assignment for you. Miss Christie told me that y'all were doing this a few weeks ago. Sometime I want you to take time to look around our sanctuary. At all in the, in the stained glass windows and everywhere else. And see it where you see things that total three. There's probably at least 50, if not twice that in here, of symbols. There's like three windows there. But also, you in the windows themselves, there are things that's, that, that are... Uh, the number three or three shaped. So I want to make you aware of all of the things within our congregation, within our church worship space. Sometime I want you to think about that and see those. Now what does the Trinity symbolize? God the... God the... And God the... Very good. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these children were baptized in your name. We are married in the covenant, O Lord, in your name of the Trinity. At the, at the graveside, we also remember the Trinity. But especially in this Christmas season, in this season of Advent, as we look forward, O God, help us to remember all that you offer us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank y'all for coming today. Our Psalter lesson is number 199. It's the Canticle of Mary. 199. It's Mary's Magnificat. of the Lord. From this day all generations shall call me blessed. The arm of the Lord is strong and has scattered the proud in their conceit. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away.
chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. sung some different things as, par as a congregation. And following the gospel lesson today, we are going to sing Prepare the Way of the Lord again. And this will be, next week we have our service of lessons and carols. So this is our last week of singing this hymn together. But the choir has spread out so that they can help you lead, uh, the, sing this hymn in parts. Uh, Charlie, you wanna give us any instructions?
Okay. You know what? It's okay to have fun in church and to try new things. All in all things, God is glorified. I invite you now to stand with me and for the reading of the gospel. To stand as you are able to rise in spirit always. Our reading comes from Matthew, the 11th chapter, starting at verse 2. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell what John what you have heard and see, what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look. Those who wear soft robes are in royal places. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has risen arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this, the holy word of our Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord, in this dry and dusty place, pour out the Spirit, the power of your Spirit, so that your Word may blossom in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our way in the wilderness. Amen. What is known of ancient prisons in Jerusalem is sparse. What we do know is that the prisons of that time were often underground, hot, and filthy. The prisoners were cut off from the world and, of course, restricted in their movement. Heavy chains, high walls, and fierce guards were par for the course. After all, prison is not supposed to be a glamour destination. John the Baptist had been in prison by the order of Herod. John was tended to, when the guards would allow it, by a group of his followers. The followers would bring him food to eat, a change of clothes, and news of the outside world. But most of John's time was spent alone. Surely he prayed. But there was another prison being constructed around him. 
during these endless days with only time on his hands. The prison that was being constructed was more formidable than any prison that the Romans could construct. It was his own personal prison, a prison of disillusionment and despair. John had prepared the way for Jesus, the Messiah, but Jesus did not seem to be the Messiah that John thought he should be. He was not swinging an ax. He was not using a winnowing fork to separate the wheat from the chaff, the good from the bad, and bringing about the final judgment. In that jail, in that prison, it must have gone through John's mind. What if I'm wrong? Why are things not moving as fast as John would th thought they would? John was in a captive, was a captive in a daunting prison made with the stones of his own despair and doubt. The fact that a saint like John battled disillusionment should be no surprise to us. There are good people all around us held captive by despair, by disillusionment, by depression. Theirs, their jailers, are not the harsh guards of the Jerusalem prison. The jailers of our time and the prisons of our disillusionment and despair are even more cruel. The, Jew, the jailers we come to know are disease and abuse and violence, and neglect, poverty, shame, chronic pain, mental health challenges, and even grief. There are a lot of people in prison, in mind, spirit, and yes, even in body, even if their address is not in a state institution. There are plenty of cells of disillusionment and despair around us. And the ones that are in these cells, the ones that are in these prisons, are the ones who look lonely, who are lonely, even in a large crowd. These are the people who mask their despair with a bright smile. These are the people who hide the chaos of their lives behind a stoic facade. But others are bound by the chains of IV lines filled with chemotherapeutic drugs. Some of the ones imprisoned by doubt and despair and disillusionment have dropped off our social radar by being confined in, in an ever-narrowing space because of age or physical condition. In the supermax prisons where the worst of the worst criminals are held, the windows in those cells are only four inches large, just a shaft of light comes into that cell. They're made that way so that the prisoner can look outside but not know where they are in the prison complex. Their orientation is lost. The windows, the windows of the prison cells of disillusionment and despair are even smaller. They let in just enough light to torture us with the visions of what we are missing in the fullness of life. Finally, the disciples on behalf of John come to Jesus and they ask Jesus, are you the Messiah or is there another one yet to come? The first thing I hope that we will mark in Jesus' response here is that 
is that Jesus does not berate John. He doesn't add to John's heavy burden by belittling him for a lack of faith. Not only that, Jesus doesn't command John just to snap out of it. Instead, Jesus offers a very compassionate, a very human, as we say in the church, a very incarnational solution. Christ offered the key the key to free John from his despair and disillusionment, Christ gave that key to John's friends. Jesus told John's friends to go and tell John what they saw and what they heard. Tell John how those imprisoned by disease and infirmity are free. Let him know that those who are haunted by the demons of self-destruction are liberated. Inform John how the poor, captive to oppressive systems and practices, are emancipated by hope. Go and tell, Jesus says. Go and tell. There's a painting by Kenneth Wyatt. I haven't found one in our con- in our church yet. There may be one around I haven't seen, but there's a painting by Kenneth Wyatt that portrays John Wesley standing on the shore as Thomas Coke, Thomas Vassy, and Richard Watcoke are getting in the, in the rowboat to go to the ship that will take them to America. The painting's title is the charge that Wesley gave those missionaries so long ago. Offer them Christ. My friends, some are called to offer Christ on a far continent by being a missionary like Thomas Coke. There are others called to offer Christ from a pulpit each Sunday like John Wesley. But all of us, all of us are called through the waters of our baptism to offer Christ to those who are imprisoned by disillusionment and despair. Our charge, our obligation, no matter what our station in life, is to offer Christ to go and tell those in the depths of despair what we see and hear of how Christ is working in the world. The foundation of the prison of despair and disillusionment in our world today is laid from isolation and loneliness. We are to offer them Christ. We start offering them Christ by being fully present with everybody we encounter. Be there. Be fully there with the people you see every day. Because in a world where each one of us is known as an account number, or by our date of birth, it's important that we see people as human beings made in the image of God, especially those who stand in front of us. And so we offer them Christ by being present in such a way that the person that you are with feels like they are the only person in the world that matters. Being present also extends to those unwillingly absent from the circles of your life. There are those who you knew or still know. You knew them well at work or in church 
or in our social circumstance, social circles, we look around and they're not present anymore because of their life circumstances. Disease, grief, and age-related conditions are cruel jailers that take people away from us. Let the vows we take in this congregation guide us, not only in, within our church fellowship, but as we offer Christ to the world. You see, with each baptism, with each membership transfer that comes into this congregation, the pastor concludes with these words, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, to confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Not just when they're running down these aisles and being baptized, but when disease or condition of life keeps them from walking steadily and keeps them absent from this place. My friends, a surprise card, a visit, or a phone call can mean more than you will ever know to those that are imprisoned by despair. But here's the thing. Let it be a regular habit. And not just a once a year Christmas obligation. Despair affects us year around. Disillusionment and despair can strike the strongest of people. I suspect in the place with as many people in, in it as it is now, there are some one of you, one, two, or ten of you that are anchored in disillusionment or despair because of your life circumstances the circumstances of someone you love. We all feel it sometimes. That's natural. That's human. But despair can rock our world and shake the foundations of our faith. In this season of Christmas, we celebrate that Christ became flesh and dwelled among us. May we follow Christ's incarnational example by offering Christ's love and compassion to those who are incarcerated, even if they don't know it, and especially for those who do, those who are incarcerated by the prisons of despair, disillusionment, and desperation. We are God's people. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. But when we see him, we shall be like him. And so we take this ministry, not just to Guatemala, not just to Sumter United Ministry, But we take it to the people within our church who sometimes we forget and sometimes we overlook. John Wesley said it best. Offer them Christ. Go and tell them what you hear and see. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this time I invite you to turn to page 211. We will sing the third verse and the third antiphon of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 211.
leader of the house of Israel, who appeared to Moses in the flames of the bush and gave him the law of on Sinai. Thank you. You may be seated. I get to tell you today the good news. Mary Thomas Oswald was born this past Wednesday. Six pounds, six ounces. As you know, she is the little sister of Lenore Oswald. You remember Lenore who wears the dress and the cowboy boots when she comes down for the children's song. Mary Thomas is Lenore's younger sister's name. And of course, Tommy and Molly are happy and we join them in their joy. There are other concerns and joys within the life of our church and the, our world. We are in a season, my friends, where there is caroling and there, is vis there are visits being made. Remember those on your street. Remember those in your neighborhood who may need cookies or a visit or a phone call. Let us prepare the way of the Lord to those as well. Now I call on Rachel to come and offer our morning prayer. Christmas. For in you all things are made new. You are working to restore and remake all the broken pieces of our lives and of this world. In you we will be glad and rejoice forever, delighting in you with joy. All this we pray through Christ, your only Son, your greatest gift to this world. Amen. As a farmer plants the seeds and waits for the rains to come, let us entrust our gifts to the Lord as we await the coming of God's rain. Well, our ushers, please come forward for the dedication of our tithes and offerings.
we pray the prayer of thanksgiving. It's found in your bulletin. Rachel will lead you. Thanks be to you, O God, maker of heaven and earth, giver of justice, lover of righteousness, hope of the afflicted, and friend of the poor. Your faithfulness never fails. Take and use these gifts we offer to further your purpose in the world and to fulfill the promise of the world to come. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord with all your soul, and may the blessing of God be with you. Go now in peace.